It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello, and welcome to Accelerate. I am excited to be joined on the show today by Mark Ripley. He's Mark is the VP of Sales for Insightly, a CRM and project management system. Mark, welcome to Accelerate. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. It's a pleasure. Well, my pleasure. So take a minute, introduce yourself. That was sort of a sketchy intro. Fill out the, <laughs> fill out the frame there and maybe tell us how you got your start in sales. Oh, no, that's an interesting question. I got my start in sales selling retail, cell phones, and car stereos um, back car in stereos. college. Car stereos, wow. Yeah. Back in I the day, had, huh? I sure did. I had a dream of owning my own car audio shop. I had a passion for it and built my own boxes and speakers, and they had a blast doing it. Um, but I fell in love with selling, and, and um, even in retail. So did that and then got an early start in technology back in San Diego, like you and I were talking about earlier. And um, so I've been selling for, you know, probably 15, 20 years and leading sales teams for about six or seven years now. Okay. And so currently at Insightly and uh, we're building a world-class sales organization and um, with, uh, with the goal of, you know, bringing CRM and adoption to small, medium-sized businesses around the world um, at scale. So we have, you know, over half a million customers today. And we'll uh, anticipate continuing to grow that. So a half million users or customers? Uh, companies, yeah. Companies. That, inclu- that includes freemium and paid. Right. So we, we have about 25,000 paying companies around mm-hmm. the world. Mm-hmm. And then the rest are on our freemium tool. But uh, yeah, a lot of users out there. A lot of users. So how is Insightly different? There's a bunch of companies. It's been an explosion of technology into the sales space. And a lot of companies are focused on that sort of small, mid-sized company space and CRM. I could spend probably the next 20 minutes talking, just naming who they are. Yeah. Um, so how is Insightly different? I mean, how are you differentiating yourselves from everything else that's out there? Yeah, I saw a slide um, recently that just, I think three years ago, there were 60 quote-unquote CRMs, depending on how you define them. Right. And today, there's well over 200, 250, some claim. <laughs> Surprise, there's I so mean, few. Right, just in three years. So for us... Um, the reason that we've been very fortunate and been so successful with the SMB space is really two things, right? One is the most important thing is the ease of use and the simplicity of the tool. Um, you know, our kind of mantra is the features and capabilities are literally irrelevant if people aren't using them systematically on a regular basis. And it's mm-hmm. really got to be an enjoyable, wonderful experience. So that we're really known for. We have... Um, we're the number one CRM globally for the G Suite users. So we have almost half the market share for um, G Suite users okay. using CRM, which is awesome. And so, so a, even though they're sort of solidly behind ProsperWorks? Yep, yep. That's, uh, there's a marketing component to that. Um, mm-hmm. So it's not completely organic. Okay. Uh, we, we've been absolutely organic um, the whole time and continue to have the number one uh, market share worldwide. So ease of use. And then the other thing is for us in the marketplace – is we do pre-sale, so organizations that do pre-sale and post-sale work, so services-based organizations, Mm -hmm. love our tool because we have a project management element into the tool. So all the pre-sale activity and conversations along with the post-sale activities and conversations all in one central system. And that's really been Customer driver. success teams then can can use this. When you say project management, is it really project management or really account management? I mean... Yeah. Okay. So it's a good, it's a good question. It's more project management because think about like advertising and media, manufacturing, consulting. Mm -hmm. These are all some of our top verticals. Okay. So when they sell a client, that's when the hard work starts. Sure. So, you know, if you're an advertising and media company and you sign a new client, you're going to be interacting with that client for years to come and customizing their marketing campaigns Mm -hmm. and doing a lot of AP testing. So there's a lot of tasks and project management element to that, and our tool works exceptionally well for that. Okay, well, I mean, there's, there's, let's drill down a little bit. So there's sort of a mythology around that basically you know, everybody that needs a CRM has one. And it certainly is not true, right? I mean, given that certainly given the new entrance you described into the marketplace, there's got to yeah. be a demand there. That, and so what are some of the, the I mean, 
needs that are unmet. I mean, you think about, gosh, we got this you know, eight hundred pound gorilla with Salesforce here that's uh, you know certainly going down market in some respects, right? With their their acquisition last year, and uh, you know, as you said, two hundred plus companies over the last few years have piled into this space. So, yeah. what is that unmet need that people still think isn't being met that's drawing all these companies into the space? The so two points. One is it was eye opening for me as well that there's just literally so many companies out there, and not all of them small. Some are mid mid size and even large that don't use a unified CRM, and or don't use it at all. Oh, yeah, they use spreadsheets or they use Google or they use you know email. It's it's really kind of mind boggling to me because I've grown up on CRM, but um, it it's a big, huge, huge thing. Um, what we find. The driver, uh, if someone's not using CRM, is it's very intimidating, and the big fear is adoption. How am I going to make my folks use this tool? And there's so many um, really awful stories of companies trying to use CRM, and it's just not working. Sure. And so it gets a bad rap sometimes. Um, so that's why we just we put so much energy into adoption, usability, and making that a wonderful experience. And how do you do that? Okay, well, it's a, that's a big question, right? So everything from UI, which we spend an enormous amount of time. Um, but a couple things that we're really famous for is integration into other tools that are extremely common. So I'll give you an example, right? So um, with Gmail. Sure. So with our tool, you can do a lot of the CRM stuff that you would normally do in a CRM. You can do it right from your Gmail. So if you end up using Gmail a lot and you're in your email client, man, this is a beautiful experience. You can do a lot of that without have to switch um, applications. So in terms of getting your, your records into your CRM system. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep, exactly. And lo- maybe looking things up and attaching things and you know all that. So those are things other CRMs aren't doing in the same way? I mean, because other people are, quite frankly, are integrated with, with Gmail. Uh, not so. There are some for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, our integration is, um, by most accounts, the best integration out there of any CRM. And we do something very similar with Outlook, um, with Office three sixty five, excuse me. Mm-hmm. And so we have a really beautiful integration there. So those okay. are the, those are two examples. But um, it's also about the user interface. Um, you know, I have a I have a actually a neighbor. It's shopping for CRMs. You know, my daughter, his daughter, go to the same school, and and he's I'm like, okay, he's he's using a big CRM today, and they hate it. And it's a little three-person company. And I said, okay, so what's your biggest challenge? He's like, it's just not flexible. Mm-hmm. It's built a certain way. Our business is changing, and we can't get the tool to change with us. Right. And, and so you talk about ease of use and adoption. That's something certainly that we're really well known for is it's very malleable, very easy to change and bend and flex to support uh, you know, anybody's business or most people's business. Okay, so what sort of value should, you know, if an SMB is saying, okay, I'm going to make that first step getting into CRM, we've just been using spreadsheets, we've been using whatever previous yeah. to this, just email. So what's the value they should expect to receive from it? So, okay, good question. So I would say it's different for everybody, right? So it depends on, I would say there's two big um, pain points slash value that a small to medium-sized business will get out of it. Maybe three things, right? Okay. One, one is certainly sales productivity. So you're using spreadsheets, you're using email, guaranteed things are slipping to the cracks. You're just op- not optimized. So you pick a CRM that you feel really good about. Um, maybe it's Insightly, maybe it's something else, but that will certainly get you organized and you will generate more revenue out of your prospects and your customers. That's That will happen. The second thing that we see a lot of is, again, a lot of our customers are service-based. So mm-hmm. You know, go back to the advertising and media example, and it's really tricky once you start to get 10, 20, 50 employees or more to try to manage all the things that go on with coordinating all these customers. So what ends up happening is a lot of things slip through the cracks. Tax get overlooked, customers end up having a poor experience, and they can leave, and that type of thing. So another big value is getting your arms around all of your customer activities mm-hmm. and making sure that they have a really world class red carpet experience so that you can continue to monetize and grow that revenue with them. So that's the second thing. Mm-hmm. That's it. The third thing is if you're, you know, call it, you know, more than 50 people, 
you're really going to, as a leadership team, you're going to struggle in a big way trying to get visibility into what's happening in the organization. Who's doing what? Where are things slipping through the cracks? Mm-hmm. What, what are the revenues looking like? What's our forecast looking like? Are we developing enough pipeline to sustain our, our forecast? Mm-hmm. All this stuff. If you're a, a five-person shop, you can manage that. You don't need a reporting system. There's, there's five of you. But if all of a sudden you're 50, 100, 500, 1,000, man, it's, it's, um, it's very painful to try to manage the business without some sort of system sure. where you can get reporting and dashboards out of it. Well, one of the, the key things about adoption, getting back to that for a second, is that you know, reps perceive CRM systems as being instruments of command and control and not something that's really a sales tool. I mean, you get very few people that say, CRM is a sales tool. I mean, we think about it as a, a database, basically. Mm-hmm. So what is in it for when they're using Insightly? What is in it for the reps that perhaps isn't there for another, another CRM system? Yeah, so it's a good question, right? And I was a sales uh, rep for a long time. And the vast majority of sales reps see a CRM as like sandbags on your ankles, slowing you down, right? You got to put all the data in there. It's going to just slow you down from actually selling. Well, that's, and, that's one of the justifications. The other thing is they just really don't want to have the accountability at the detail level that's expected. <laughs> in the, and, you know, somewhat understandably so. I mean, but there's that trade-off, right? I mean, I'll accept the accountability if, if there's something for me on the other side. Yeah. If this makes so, my, if truly makes my job easier. Absolutely. So, um, one of the big trends that we see in CRM over the next year and even handful of years is, you know, I talk a lot about return on time, right? Time mm-hmm. is, is liquid gold for mm-hmm. sales reps. Sure. So the question, yeah, the question is, um, every minute, every hour of the day, how can you get the most return on your time? And so CRM can play a big role in that in helping them generate a higher ROT on their hours and their days by trying to automate um, a lot of things. So when I say automate, I'll say it in two categories. One is customer facing. So there's a lot of mundane things that a sales rep does every day that quite frankly, they don't need to be doing actively. Right? I'll give you an example, like a drip campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're a real estate agent and you're showing a house and someone comes sure. by and signs up. And now you have a system that can, you know, before, you know, the world of today, that, that person would have to email or mail, right? Every third, sure. fifth, seventh day manually. Now there's automated systems to do that. Awesome. So as a sales rep, I'm basically able to do more in less time. So that's on the customer side. The second bucket, bucket that I was referring to is um, how can I automate as much of the um, logging of information into the CRM without having to manually do it? And so I'll give you a couple examples, right? So using our Gmail integration, Mm -hmm. it'll automatically take all these emails that you're doing and log it into the system so you don't have to manually click, 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 click. It's just minimizing all these clicks really starts to add um, a lot of value and save time. The other thing that we're going to be launching here um, in the first half of next year, it's really exciting. And other CRMs do this. It's not completely unique to Insightly, but is where you can record calls. And then the call will automatically get transcribed into the CRM. Okay. So you think about all the time and energy put into transcribing and translating notes right. from calls. And it's like, boom, that recording is already in the CRM, transcribed. So start to save a lot of time um, and also have the benefit of staying organized. Okay, but you're not adding the dialing function, though. Yeah, we are. Oh, you are. Okay. All right. So yep. you have a power dialer built into Insightly. And, okay. Yep. Well, with the advent of Twilio, um, sure, you know, yeah, it's it's amazing. We're using it on our own internal team today, and it's fantastic. Okay, it's huge. So, um, yeah, you started talking about you know the future and what's what's happening, and and I guess one thing that and you use the word productivity and return on time, and and this is a topic I explore with most of my guests. It seems like we get to this at one point or another because sort of a. Uh, passion point with me, perhaps, is that we talk about reps doing more, but it's it's not abundantly clear from the data that's out there that we see from industry research reports and so on that mm-hmm. reps really are doing more. And in terms of number of reps, zero percentage of reps meeting quota and close mm-hmm. rates that we see in certain industries, 
So, yeah, I, I'm still, you know, sort of digging and say, okay, well, where where is that real connection, you know, that we can really point to and say, yeah, this is really happening. That the investment in these technologies, well, absolutely, we can't do without a CRM system, but is it really boosting our productivity? Um, and that's, I mean, that's that's really to me is like an open question because again, I see these research reports and it's saying, yeah, we're sort of staying steady. Some say we're, you know, we're actually productivity or performance. Let's say I'll distinguish the two. Okay. Performance is actually dropping in B two B sales space. Um, you know, where yeah. where do we turn the corner on this? Okay, so this is a really thought provoking question. It's it's a good. That's one. why we're here. <laughs> I like it. Um, so we could have a couple beers and probably talk about this all night. Like this is a cool, really cool topic. I would say that um, the first thing that comes to mind is every industry, every company um, is different, right? So we talk about like enterprise versus mm-hmm. mid-market versus SMB sales, and there's very different motions there. So uh, anyway, you can you can go this go at it a couple different ways. I would say my initial take on it is um, fundamentally. We know that there's two things that drive uh, productivity, right? We know it's activity and we know it's skills, right? It's how much stuff you're doing and how good are you at it, right? And good at you at it, how good are you are at something has to do with training and tools and resources, all kinds of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's how much stuff you're doing and how effective you are when you're doing it. Um, and so if we believe that, right, I would argue it, it should be. Yeah, I'm not sure I buy in that 100%, but go ahead. Okay, so if if we do buy into that, um, then activity, assuming that we keep the skill set and the um, the effectiveness the same, we keep that variable the same. Mm-hmm. Then, in theory, the more stuff you're doing, then in, you'll be more productive. Um, I can point to, but I could. I also hear what you're saying. In that, <laughs> well, that as a, <laughs> the people listening couldn't see me, so I'm rolling my eyes a little bit. But it, it, but you brought up an interesting point before, as you talked about time, mm-hmm. right? So. You talked about activities and skills, but if you look at productivity, mm-hmm. the definition of productivity is the rate of output for a unit of input. Correct. So, you know, activities really doesn't relate to that because activities don't, by themselves, you look at them, they don't relate to outcomes. What, so, if you could do, what if you could do more activity with the same amount of energy? But if it's not moving the needle on sales, then who cares? See, I think, and I think what, that's one of the things we're getting into is, mm-hmm. in sales is that that definitely we're able to do more things, right? Okay. Whatever those things are. But I don't think we've made the point yet that across, that other than sort of high growth companies, some of which are going to have a proclivity to grow anyway, regardless of, of the process. Right. But outside of that, in the world at large, and it sounds like the world that you deal with, because you know you're not focused purely on tech businesses as your customers. Is this really making a difference? And is it really say to me productivity is is we need to measure it in sales just like we measure it in industry. Uh-huh. So you know we talk about our productivity rate as an economy. It's that measure, right? What's our how many how much labor is it taking us to produce one widget or one unit of you know product, productive output, whatever that is? How do you measure it? Yeah. I think yeah, that's so the issue we have in sales is, is we use the word so loosely. Laissez faire, laissez faire. Yeah, and I, I would completely agree with you that it's a, probably an overused word. And um, But I would argue, as I'm thinking about it, I'm coming up with a couple examples in my mind that I have been able to measure the increased output. But um, I also agree with you that I've used, seen it used you know, a whole bunch of times where it's you know, there's an assumption there, but is it measured? So I'll give you one example, and this is a pretty straightforward one, and that is for businesses that get leads, mm-hmm. right? Not all businesses do, sure. but for, bus- for businesses that get leads, um, there is certainly a lot of data around the number of touches and the speed in which you can react to that lead will drive up propensity for someone to um, have a conversation, get sure. into the pipeline. Yeah, the inside sales MIT study, yes. Yeah, it's exactly right. So if you look at technology um, like workflow automation, which is built into uh, Insightly and a few other mm-hmm. CRMs as well, is you get leads, you can automate that frequency, mm-hmm. right? And also the speed. So that has certainly given an uptick in productivity 
as measured by an SDR's ability to generate opportunities, which then, then close. Um, we personally haven't seen a drop in close rates when using tools like this. Mm -hmm. So there is an example of using a tool to generate more productivity. Um, but I am also with you in that it, it certainly can be overused. Yeah, and I wasn't saying that use of the tools causes mm -hmm. the close rate. I think, but what we're seeing, and again with somewhat imperfect data, because I don't think no one uses the terminology in the same way, uh -huh. is that we don't have a really good way to gauge whether, in aggregate, the tools are helping. Meaning, are we actually using them in the right way? Mm. One or Maybe this is just a generation too soon, and we're going to need you know, the AI, we're going to need the machine learning, we're going to need something else to help it get yeah. to that level where it needs to be. You know, I like, what you're, I like some of the things you're bringing up. Um, and I, as it's occurring to me, there's so many variables, right, that come into play. Like to your point earlier, if you're in a high-growth company, it's going to grow regardless. Um, that is probably may not be attributed to your techniques or your process or your tools, mm -hmm. you're just in a good spot at a good time. Um, well, but we attribute it to the process and the tools. Well, you know, especially if you're a VP of sales, of course it's all me. <laughs> of course no, you I'm do, just right? <laughs> I'm just totally kidding. Well, no, but that's, um, that's true, right? And we see that especially in the tech space more than more than others. So, so I guess that, you know, and that's sort of, I think the other thing that's sort of interesting to think about with a lot of the technologies that are coming out in sales, and CRM to some degree falls into this, is that there's no conscious decision to say, okay, well, there's something in this for the buyer. Right? Oh. There's something in it for sales, but what's in it for the buyer? Okay. I mean, that's, that's because to me, unless we help the sales rep, getting back to you talk about, and this is, yeah, I brought up years ago in my first book, Zero Time Selling, I used the term return on time invested by the buyer. Unless we help the buyer see a better return on the time they invest in, in their buying process, um, which is fundamentally what they're trying to do, is how are we, how are we helping the salespeople? Right? If we're not yep. able, helping the salespeople to help the buyer make better, faster, quicker decisions, mm -hmm. uh, what are we doing for it? Just so we can keep track of what's going on? Okay. So you're one of the first people I've heard um, talk about it like this, I also very strongly believe in the R in CRM, right? The relationship. Mm -hmm. And when I think about, as I'm preparing for this um, session we're doing and talking about, you know, the future of CRM, that type of thing, when I think about it, I think about it absolutely from the customer lens and the sales rep lens. And they're two different lenses. Sure. Um, but the customer lens is equally important. And I would argue it's something that's been neglected in the past. And, um, I maybe I'm being optimistic, but I really see some of the trends in the future to start to focus more and more on that customer experience. Now, my take on it is I would look at it in two um, two buckets, if you mm -hmm. will, pre-sale and post-sale. Sure. Right. So the world that we live in, software as sales folks, everything happens in a lot of way pre-sale, and then we sell something, it's packaged, and it's gone. Right. But the reality of it is, there's a massive, massive world out there. It doesn't work that way, right? So a manufacturer, if you and I owned an alternator company and you know we work with all the major <laughs> auto manufacturers, right? we're not getting leads. Didn't know right? they still made alternators, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> right? We haven't engineered Maybe. those out of cars yet? Yeah, totally. One day. Um, we wouldn't get leads, right? All of our work would be post-sale with our existing customers to take amazing care of them, right? And give them world-class red carpet treatment. That's what we'd be focused on. And so to your point, how can a CRM tool and other tools help the customer have a more amazing red carpet world-class treatment? Mm -hmm. And of course, they win, right? And of course, the company wins as well, so they continue to grow that relationship. And well, they grow that relationship, they get referrals, the whole thing, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Great point about referrals, yeah. So, um, so that's that part. I, I think is grossly missed by most people when they think about CRM and sales tools is that whole, whole post-sale experience. Um, and then pre-sale, so uh, I'm a big pass, I'm a big fan of this as well, and you frame it, what's, what's in it for the customer? What's the customer's value add by you know, um, working with sales teams that have tools like this? Um, and it's something that every sales organization I've continued to try to get better and better, and I don't think there's an end state, 
but is trying to get more and more personal around the messaging and the value that we're bringing to the customer. Meaning at a very simplistic state, um, the way I interface with the manufacturing prospect Mm -hmm. versus the advertising prospect should be different. Mm -hmm. Their needs and their challenges and where they want to go most likely in that industry are different. And I should be able to add value and treat them differently. And ideally, that's uh, that benefits both of us, right? Ideally, the customer gets more value out of that um, experience. And then, of course, um, ideally, we get more customers. Okay. So, yeah, undoubtedly, we're in the era of big data. And data has a lot of influence on increasingly on what's happening in terms of analytics and so on. Mm-hmm. Now, somewhere you're talking about you believe in small data, not big data. So what, what do you mean about that? Um, when we talk to uh, customers, and you know, I was going to say mid-market customers and small businesses, but at the end of the day, they're even big businesses. The concept of big data is really intimidating, right? They get that it's this big movement, um, but in their minds, it requires you know, an army of data scientists and all these fancy tools to get out and see if they can make sense of this data. And there's lots of also, you know, tough stories over the years where, you know, by the time they get in there and figure it all out, the business has totally changed. Mm-hmm. It's irrelevant. Mm-hmm. So um, for me, I think about data and being a lot smarter and utilizing data, but doing it in a very tangible way that's digestible, that's actionable, that's ideally in a time compressed way, in a compressed fashion. So that so could give an be, example. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'll give you an example from a sales perspective, but sure. maybe just to finish that thought, you, you know, you may have big ambitions to do this big thing around data and get insights. And so you can, um, either gain some efficiencies at your sales team or unlock perhaps different elements of a market. But my suggestion on small data is just break the bigger thing up into smaller chunks and almost like the agile software methodology, break mm-hmm. it up into smaller chunks that you start, you finish, you iterate, you measure, and then you move on to the next chunk. So it's just breaking up big, quote-unquote, data that can be a little overwhelming, and they're just smaller, bite-sized chunks. Um, so anyway, that's kind of how I, how I look at it. And uh, then people actually take action and do it, opposed to just getting overwhelmed and, and procrastinating. Um, you were going to say? No, go ahead. Go ahead. So um, I, I've been doing this sales, uh, software sales thing for a while, so I have a very clear sense of how I use data and a small data perspective to run a very high um, productivity, productivity, there's the word, Mm -hmm. highly efficient, highly productive team. Um, And in my mind, maybe I'm using the wrong terminology, but I think about it as small data because it's very crisp. I know exactly what I'm looking for and it's not some big, you know, massive spreadsheet that's, or dashboard that's hard to get data out of. It's like, shoom, fine tune. What really matters, focus on that. Um, and move the needle. Yeah, well, I think you're really talking about focus, right? Because I read something not that long ago, but managers can keep in mind, like, the average manager, like, three statistics, right, that they can really focus on, three KPIs or whatever, however you want to metrics, however you want to label them. And beyond that, yeah, just it's hard for them really to focus on and manage. Yeah. So, yeah, big data obviously presents a lot of opportunity, but I think your point is focus on the ones, find the ones that really benefit what you're doing and that you get value yeah. from yep. and focus on those. And so last sort of question about this before I move to the last segment of the show is, is, you know, what do you see happening with CRM relative to the influx of AI and machine learning? I mean, I know a lot of hype around those, those particular topics, but sort of can't talk about it or talk about CRM without asking about it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. So I, uh, I, I've been here about eight months at Insightly mm-hmm. and building out the sales team. And so a few months in, my CEO and founder is a product guy, right? He's built the product. That's his passion. And so I start going into the one-on-ones. I'm like, okay, let's you know, set up a rhythm for forecasting. And, mm-hmm. and he pauses and he stops me. And he says, you know, it's not going to be too long before I can tell you what your forecast is going to be. And I said, Okay, tell me more about that. He's like, honestly, we're going to build it into the CRM and we're going to build accurate forecasting into the CRM and bring it to the masses. Oh my gosh, so, you're opening a topic we could spend the next half hour on. Um, <laughs> how, how's he proposing to do that? So it's, um, 
it's a big animal, right? Yeah. Um, so we're certainly tackling it. It's not going to come out next month, right? It's a bigger kind of ambitious thing, but um, there's a couple things that come to mind. One is forecasting is typically done really poorly, uh, grossly sure. poorly. Everybody acknowledges. What's that? Everybody acknowledges that. Right. And it's super time consuming from a sales leadership perspective, which is my world. Um, and it's done pretty bad. And it's not that hard. I, I happen to be a data guy. So for me, it, it speaks to me. But um, I mean, human beings have put people in space on the moon, like to do to be able to create a very systematic way to forecast and put it into a machine and have it pop out shouldn't be that difficult. Um, so in my mind, I certainly think that it's crazy valuable. I certainly think that um, Insightly and perhaps others will get better at putting more accurate forecasting at the fingertips of people that aren't necessarily data people. Well, isn't part of it, though, that as an industry, we have to sort of change our idea about what the, the, the right paradigm is to use for forecasting? So right now, certainly one of the most predominant methods to use is to use sort of assigning probabilities based on stage that you're at in the sales process, which, to my way of thinking, has some inherent fallacies <laughs> built into it that just can't be overcome. Namely, that a stage of a sales process somehow is right. connected to your probability of closing the deal. So, for instance, an example I always give is, let's say you assign a 75% probability to a deal if it gets to a proposal stage. Mm -hmm. What if you have four competitors? Do they yep. each... Do you each have 75% chance of closing the deal? <laughs> right. A add those numbers up, 4 times 75. Well, I mean, it, yeah. I'm sure someone can nuance Samantha way, <laughs> way better than I can, but I, on the surface, of it, I don't think that everybody has a 75% chance of winning. Yep. So, but that's, right? Isn't that, am I right though? Isn't that how predominantly everybody forecasts? I would say yes, and I completely agree with you that it's, um, and that's why the end result is always so inaccurate, right? Sure. Um, and so I 100% agree with you. Stages shouldn't be tied exclusively to percentages. You could also have an amazing customer that just comes back and you know wants to, you know, buy more. You know, it's a lock, and you know, it's the beginning stage of a cycle. But you know, you have it. Um, yeah, I mean, if you use the other way, I I use the phrase like I think I came up with, which was you know, if you use the probabilities based on stage, which is you know your how far into the sales process you've gone, I say that's like you can't measure probability with a yardstick. And that's essentially uh, what you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, great analogy. Yeah. Absolutely. So for me, um, I have found a lot more success in um, using history. And if you capture the data and measure it in the right way, mm -hmm. then you can, you can get incredibly accurate in terms of looking at the leading indicators sure. and predicting the outcome. Um, than simply just looking at percentages and stages and volume. Yeah, well, I think certainly the history is there if you get enough transactions to look back over length of time in each stage and stage exit criteria, where they melt, where they met, da 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 da, and, and project that, yeah, whether your yeah. CEO is, is 100% correct or whether the forecast generated will be 100% correct, it's going to be closer. But one of the things that's, yes. that's not factored into, which, again, we have to move on, so we won't spend a lot of time on it, but is that you know, we don't teach people how to forecast. And there's actually been mm -hmm. studies done showing that when people have to do forecasts, and not necessarily sales forecasts, but other type of prediction, um, that actually they can be taught, A, they can be taught how to make, over time, how to make more accurate predictions, and B, is given the right incentives, they actually get better as well. So have you ever known... I mean, very few organizations tie any of managers' bonuses to accuracy of forecast. But yeah. there's some research that says that as one component of a program, if you did that, over time, you would become a learning organization and learn how to forecast more accurately. Yeah. And there's cer certainly value in that. Or, <laughs> or, or if they're incented to be accurate in their forecasting, will they avoid going over <laughs> by sandbagging deals? I don't know, right? That was that's always my fear sure. with incenting accurate forecasting. I don't know the answer; it's just a thought. Um, but I'd be interested to explore it and maybe and try it. Yeah, it would depend on. Yeah, depend on what the ramifications would be for the organization of of managers sandbagging forecast. Yeah, 
I mean, certainly if it's a production based, like a <clears throat> manufacturer you're working with, yeah, that you're in real trouble if you chronically underestimate and overperform on your forecasts and you don't have availability of product to ship. That's a problem. Absolutely. That's for no good. software, less of an issue for perhaps, but you still have to have issues relative to resources, support, and all those other things that come with it. So, yeah, I mean, everybody has has uh, absolutely yeah a bit of a quandary if if they're under forecasting and overperforming against that. Yeah, I would um, just a quick comment on one of your um, comments earlier, and that is for for the audience out there. I think it's a very, very, very common thing for sales leadership to do is to assume that everyone's forecasting the same way. In other <laughs> words, right? And you know, as a sales leader, you know, I've taught it. Uh, I've gotten everyone in the room. I've asked everyone questions. Sure. And then, like a month later, some new person will come in and say, "Okay, um, you know, when do we create an op?" And we'll get two totally different answers mm-hmm. in the same room. And mm-hmm. you're like, as a sales leader, wow. But it's something that we can all do a lot better at, and, and that is just not assume that everyone on the team is forecasting the same way. And when I say forecasting, meaning like what's the amount of the op, the stage sure. of the op, the timeline. Um, but I guess my point is is that um, I've taken it to reinforce constantly and not right. assume because then it'll make your forecasting a lot more accurate if everyone's beating from the same drum. Well, sure. I mean, and that is this could be a whole separate episode on the assumptions that sales managers make that are costly. And one of them could be something as simple as, yeah, I assume that all of our leads are being followed up. <laughs> right. That's a good one. <laughs> so yeah, start there. And then that's, it all ripples through. And uh, Mark, last segment of the show, I've got some standard questions. I ask all my guests. And the first one's a hypothetical scenario. And in this, I mean, you probably know the answer is very easily. In the scenario, you've just been hired as VP of sales at a company whose sales have stalled out. And CEO is anxious to hit the reset button. Mm. So what two things would you do your first week on the job that could have the biggest impact? Ooh, okay. I intentionally did not do my research on the four questions because I wanted <laughs> to get the raw. Oh, so good. let me think about this. Um, Most people just... Don't listen to it. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a big. I don't like watching trailers of movies. Like I want to be surprised. Right. Um, so what's going through my head is learning, right? And as I'm thinking about this, um, there's probably two things that come to mind. Right? And I know you said two, but I'd say let's go three because why not? Um, one is um, I learned very early on the people in the trenches often have the answers, okay. right? So I'd come up with um, a handful of thought-provoking questions, and I would ask um, uh, a cross-section of the folks on the floor these same consistent sure. questions and under, understand from them um, things like, what's going wrong? You know, mm-hmm. What do we need to fix? Right? Just very kind of fundamental questions. Um, I'd certainly ask the same questions to leadership. Um, there's a question that I like to ask leadership uh, when trying to fix things. That I'm new to, and that is, you know, if you could have changed any decision over the last two years, what would it have been, right? And then you start to unravel that, and it typically is pretty telling. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the third thing, I'm a big data guy, so I would certainly start to dive into data and start to put the data in my framework, and so that I can understand and diagnose, diagnose right. um, exactly what's going sideways and what that trend looks like, because that won't tell you the answers, but it'll tell you. Um, where the problems and where the opportunities are so that then you can go dig and figure out the root cause of these things. Okay, good answer. All right, so now we've got some rapid-fire questions. You can give me one-word answers if you want or elaborate. So the first one is when you, Mark Ripley, are out selling, mm-hmm. what's your most powerful sales attribute? Thought-provoking questions. Okay. Who's your sales role model? Uh, um, so I've had several, been very fortunate that way, but, um, the one, the big one for me is a gentleman by the name of Abe Smith. And, uh, if he's out here, out there, um, absolutely fantastic leader. Okay. And, uh, what's one book every salesperson should read? So it's an oldie and, and maybe not all that innovative, but, um, how to win friends and influence people. It's so, number one on the list. We've interviewed over 400 people now. It's number one on the list. Is that right? Yeah. It's just, it's, it's got some really great fundamentals in there um, and some great stories, too, that illustrate uh, the learnings. Okay. So last question. What music's on your playlist? 
Oh, okay. Um, so I'm a bit of a hip hop guy, which might be a little <laughs> odd. Um, I will vary depending on what kind of mood I'm in. If I want to get pumped up, I will listen to some rock and roll for sure. Mm-hmm. Give some Black Crows, some Zeppelins, probably one of my all-time favorites. Um, and but on the hip hop side, um, I got a, a hot song. Uh, Ice Cubes, actually, I love Ice Cube. Yeah. Um, the song right now is Players Club. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, it's got me going. Oh uh, yeah. All right. There you go. Probably could have gone twenty years, and no one would have guessed that one. But uh, <laughs> all right. Well, Mark, thanks for joining me today on the show. Great to uh, talk with you. So tell people they can find out more about Insightly and connect with you. Yeah. So Insightly.com. We have a free fourteen day trial and. Um, you know, we have a whole wonderful group of sales folks that reach out and try to help you understand how you can use it and get value out of it. Um, so I encourage you to try it, check it out, and we'd love the opportunity. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on LinkedIn at uh, Mark Ripley, and uh, happy to help if I can. Thanks right. for having me. Oh, great. Well, thanks again. And friends, thank you, as always, for spending the time with us today. And remember, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. And one easy way to do that is make sure you don't miss any of my conversations with top (laughs) business experts like my guest today, Mark Ripley, who shared his expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks again for joining me. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.